Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am um, I'm going to call the uh, Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control to order. It is Monday, October 21st, 2024. Do we have any changes or additions? Okay, we have minutes from September 16th. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to read those. Do I have a motion? So, so I have a, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Okay. Yeah. So I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion to approve the minutes from George and I have a second from Richard. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes from September 16th, 2024, say aye. 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 And I need to, Chris? Yes, uh, I, I say aye as well. Okay, from now on, I'll try and remember, uh, since we do have one board member on Zoom remote, I will be calling for a roll call. So you can just do a roll call right now. So, Laura? Laura? Uh, I'm sorry. Aye. Or aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don is aye as well, so that would be unanimous. Thank you. I was looking at Chris's field. <laughs> it's right by my house. <laughs> The view from his window. I'm not sure if that's statutory or if it's just a strong recommendation from VLCT, but that's the way we'll proceed tonight since one of our members isn't here. Uh, license, uh, liquor license renewals. We have one renewal from Davy Gourmet LLC, and it's my understanding that our chief of police, Jason Luno, is fine with this. Chief Luno, let's do it. Okay. So, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the liquor license renewal for Davy Gourmet LLC. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Richard and a second by George. All those, any discussion? All those in favor of the, um, Laura? Aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don is aye as well. So that would be unanimous. Uh, tobacco license, we have none, and we have no request to cater. So I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by George, second by Richard. Discussion. Laura? I just, I just have a question. You said yeah, uh, David Gourmet was a renewal? Yeah, it says renewal, and then it says. Is new. You know, I was, I, I'm not familiar with this business, but it does say renewal in two places on here, but it also says a license application. Yeah, because they have, um, just technicality, but they, uh, they've got, they started a brick and mortar, but that's a different license, so I don't know what, how to proceed with that, because I do think it's, I'm assuming this is for the brick and mortar. Okay. Oh, Sarah's not here. I can't. It's a second class. I mean, I don't think there's an issue, but just in the notes, I don't know. I'm just need... I'll just... follow up with Sarah when okay. she returns. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Clarify your question. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion to adjourn, Laura. Uh, aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don is aye as well. Okay, so we are now out of the Board of Liquor and Tobacco Control. Good. Okay. Uh, good evening once again. I'm going to call the uh, select board meeting to order for Monday, October 21st. 2024. It is 534. For uh, any changes or additions? No. Thank you. So once again, I'm just going to have some brief general announcements. Anyone wishing to speak in person must come forward to the microphone in the center aisle. Participants on Zoom should click on the raise their hand button if they wish to speak and mute their microphone when not speaking. Online participants, please confirm that you can hear me by clicking on your raise the hand button.
I have one, I have two, I have three. All participants must state their full name before addressing the assembly. All questions and remarks must be addressed to the chair. Your speeches must be confined to the merits of the item. In-person participants will be allowed to speak first, then Zoom participants. All participants will be allowed to speak twice on a given item for a maximum duration of two minutes. After you've spoken once on a particular item, you will not be recognized a second time during discussion on that item until all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. So we have minutes to approve. Uh, we have four sets of minutes. So the first set of minutes are from October 3rd, 2024. Do I have a motion? So I have a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by George, second by Richard. Discussion? Hearing none. Laura? Aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don is an aye as well, so that would be unanimous. We also have minutes from October 7th, 2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by George and a second by Richard. Discussion? So, Laura? Aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don would be an aye as well. Minutes from October 9th, 2024. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? second? So I have a motion by George. I have a second by Richard. Discussion. Laura? Aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. And Don would be an aye as well. Finally, minutes from October 15th, 2024. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion by George and a second by Richard. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> so used to saying that. Aye. Laura. Aye. George. Aye. Richard. Aye. Chris. Aye. And Dom would be an aye as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. New business. Um, we have a presentation tonight. We have a guest here who's going to be doing some presenting. I'm going to introduce him in just a second. Um, our town administration made sure that uh, we've had a lot of discussion about roads in town for several years. And so we had a uh, pavement condition and network level analysis done. And I'm going to, um, I'm going to ask David Hoyne, who's here in the audience, to come forward and give a presentation from the work that he's done, or that his uh, business organization has done. And I just ask you uh, first, Chris, if you could, uh, or David, if you could uh, just give us your credentials and uh, just give us a little background on yourself before you jump into your presentation. And then I just ask the board, uh, maybe let David go through his whole presentation and then we'll, we'll save our questions till the end and we'll certainly give the audience a chance to ask questions as well. But welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that very much. Everybody hear me? Okay. I realize I'm supposed to be addressing the board and the chair, but it's kind of awkward to have an audience behind you. <laughs> I want to make sure I sort of make eye contact and get to know everybody as best I can. So. And David, I'm going to interrupt right away. I'm going to break my own rule. But the, okay. mic the microphone is really for the Zoom participants. So the audience behind you, obviously, we have nothing magnifying that. Okay. So if you can't hear me, Throw something at me, let me know, and I'll try to speak a little bit louder. So uh, I'm, I'm David Hoyne, and I work for this company called uh, Greenman Patterson. We're a full service engineering company, uh, 1,800 employees up and down the East Coast. We do a whole bunch of different things. In Vermont, we, uh, we have a large presence here, about 50 or 60 people, and we're heavily involved in asset management, uh, construction inspection, 
and uh, some other projects helping communities navigate the, uh, the business of developing road and bridge projects. So a little bit about me. Uh, I've been with the company about seven years now. Uh, my title is Director of Construction Services in Vermont. I oversee the operations here in the state. And uh, prior to joining GPI, I retired from the Vermont Agency of Transportation. So uh, I started out as a bridge designer, uh, did that for a number of years. Then I moved into the field of pavement management. Uh, from there, I went to bridge management. And then finally, I finished my career as the director of the Construction and Materials Bureau, where I oversaw all the state highway construction programs and our materials testing facility. So I've got a good diverse background, bridge design, pavement management, asset management, construction, materials, and so forth. So about 35 years doing this, and uh, I love it. I'm passionate about it, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present the, our findings to you and the opportunity to, to work for the community and, and share with you what some of, our, uh, some, some of our observations. So with that, we'll jump right in. We've got a slide deck. Uh, so we'll be following along on the, on the screen here. And as uh, the chairman mentioned, uh, this is a pavement condition and network level analysis for the town. And if we jump to the next slide, uh, the presentation here is gonna follow this, uh, the scope of work. So we were retained to provide this scope of services, which is identify the paved roads in town. Okay, so what are the paved roads that are included in the study? We wanted to develop a data collection framework. So if we're gonna go out and look at these roads, what are those attributes that we want to look at? So we developed this data collection framework. We went through and did what's called a windshield survey. So we went around and uh, looked at all these roads and then with that information, we could prepare this network level analysis. And I'll explain a little bit later what a network level analysis is. And then of course, we're developing uh, and presenting the, uh, the final report here tonight. So as a quick summary of our paved roads uh, in town, we have uh, approximately 36.76 miles of pavement. And we break those down into different classifications of highways. So we have three classifications here for paved roads. Class one town highways, class two, and class three. So your class ones, for instance, are your uh, state routes that come through the community. So for instance, Vermont 100, uh, Vermont 12, and Vermont 15A. Then we have our class two town highways, uh, and then uh, class three town highways. And if you look at the segment distribution here, there are 74 total segments. Uh, 61 of those segments are what we call the class three town highway. So most of your, you know, your, your, your smaller roads, your residential uh, parts of the neighborhood, uh, as opposed to your class two, which are more your longer roads, Randolph Road, Katie's, Katie's Falls Road, things like that. And as I mentioned, your, your class town one, class uh, one town highways. And you see the mileage distribution. There's 2.8 miles of those class ones. There's 14.6 and change miles of the class two and 19. Uh, two, two miles of the class three. So we went through and said, what's this data collection framework? What is it that we're interested in knowing? Well, we need to know, uh, we'd like to know the classification of the road, which we just described, uh, where the road begins and ends, the total length of it. Does it have things like curbing on the road? Uh, things like drainage, because that can affect the treatments that we select later on. And then the next group here looks at thermal cracking, structural cracking, rutting, raveling, and ride quality. And those are common defects that we experience with pavement. Uh, so, and what we were looking for is to decide, to determine if there's thermal cracking present, if there's structural cracking present, uh, whether the pavement is rutting, whether there is raveling, uh, and how is the ride quality? So as, as our traveling public traverses a road, how smooth or rough is that road? And then we wanted to see what was the overall pavement condition, you know, in terms of good, fair, poor, and, and very poor. And then we annotated that with any other general observations that we noted about that road segment. So that's basically what we, what we did when we went out with our, um, with our windshield survey. And so we did that, we collected all that data, we ran around, looked at all the roads, drove all of them, usually in both directions, captured the data, processed it. And so we're breaking these down now into uh, conditions. So again, looking at the mileage of class one town highways, and we say there's 2.88 miles of class one. Uh, most of those were paved between 2019 and 2022, 
And so you're no surprise, most of them are in good condition, 2.7 miles. Uh, there's a little segment that is in poor condition, and I'll see, we'll show you an image of that shortly, and that's just a section of Bridge Street. Uh, and it sort of begins on the bridge, and then as you come right off the bridge, you can see in the wheel path, and I'll, I'll have an image of that shortly. So on the class two, there's our distribution of our 14 miles. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, you've got about, say, six or so miles in the fair to good category and about eight and, eight and change, which are poor, very poor. We do the same thing with class threes. And then you break up the total mileage. And what we can see from this is, you know, the poor and very poor make up a little over 50% and your fair and good mileage make up a little bit less than 50% of the, of the network. So now if we look at some of the, what are the dominant defects, and we're curious to know what the dominant defects are because they really drive our decision-making process in terms of what are we gonna do to uh, preserve or rehabilitate that section of the road. The image here you see is of Bridge Street, and uh, if, Sure, most of you are probably drive over this on a regular basis. You've seen this and wondered what this is. Well, this is what we refer to as raveling. And it's not uncommon on the class one town highways to uh, experience raveling in the wheel path. And what this is, it's a defect where the, uh, the liquid asphalt and the aggregate, their bond is broken. And over time, due to the wear and tear from vehicles, that uh, material breaks down and then uh, you end up with this, this defect. And if it gets this bad, as you see, it's already worn through the wearing surface, and now it's getting down into the next layer of pavement. Some people may confuse it with rutting. It's not traditional rutting, but it has the same sort of effect for drivers because it will pool water, and uh, in a high water situation, it'll feel like you're driving through a rut, but it's technically raveling. So on class one town highways, the dominant defects you see are reflective cracking, and raveling. And reflective cracking is just that. There is cracking that existed before, and even though you pave over it, in a matter of time, <laughs> that cracking will migrate to the surface, and it's just reflecting the crack pattern that was there uh, before you paved it. It's very common. So that's a dominant defect on your class one town highways. For your class two and class three town highways, your dominant defect is uh, structural uh, or fatigue cracking. And again, the image there shows us the, the classic crack pattern. And when we look at that, we say, oh, that looks like uh, the skin of an alligator. So anytime some people refer to it as alligator cracking, uh, that's a clear indication that you have structural or fatigue cracking. The reasons for that are you can have an inadequate amount of pavement. So your pavement thickness is not adequate for the loadings. You may not have enough subbase below that pavement to support the pavement and you may not have adequate drainage because just like you walk on the beach right at the edge of that uh, tide zone, that sand gets really mushy when it's wet. Well, the same thing is true here. If our sub bases are saturated, when vehicles go over that, that causes a premature failure of our, of our road. So your dominant defect for your class two and class three town highways is structural or fatigue cracking. And we wouldn't know if it's actually a pavement deficiency, a sub-base deficiency, or a drainage problem without actually doing a little bit more investigations, things like test pits to figure out what is actually going on there. But from the surface, we can tell that's, that's clearly what we have. So before I get to the end, which would be our network level analysis, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some pavement management strategies and pavement management terminologies. because we're going to need to understand a few things uh, for us to understand what, the, uh, what our network level analysis is telling us later on. So if we look at this graph, uh, this came out of the 2018 uh, asset, transportation asset management plan that VTrans put together. And don't get so hung up on the numbers. Uh, that they have for their treatments, right? So it says preventive maintenance is between 75 and 250,000 a year. Don't get hung up on those. Just look at the concept of what's happening to this, this graph. And if we look at that green curved line, what it's telling us is that when we build a road or a major rehab, it starts out in good condition. And over time, if we do nothing to that road, it will end up in, over time, it'll end up in very poor condition. And we have little layers between that, where we say, okay, it starts off as good, over a period of time it becomes fair, 
The more time passes, it becomes poor, and in the end, it becomes very poor. And what we know is that as that pavement progresses through its lifespan, we know that they're right, the right time to perform certain treatments. So for instance, when your pavement's in good condition, you want to perform your preventive maintenance treatments. You know, a nice crack sealing operation, keep the water out of your pavement. When it gets to fair, now maybe we're talking about an overlay and crack sealing is no longer appropriate. Gets into poor, crack sealing is clearly not appropriate. Maybe we need a structural overlay or another treatment like a full depth reclamation and so on. And we get down to the very poor, we're talking about major, major rehabilitation, maybe even reconstruction. So the, the purpose of this is to know what happens to your pavement over time, starts in good, ends up in very poor, if you don't do anything to it. There's appropriate times for appropriate treatments and the treatments get more expensive the longer you wait. So, next slide. And when we look at the life cycle of a road, we're going to say that if we build a road in year zero, uh, and maybe in three to 10 years, we're gonna do some preventive maintenance to that. Maybe at year eight to 15, we're getting into some resurfacing, you know, a level and overlay. Maybe 50, year 15 to 20, we do some uh, uh, full depth reclaim. After a full depth reclaim, you can reset the cycle and back to preventive maintenance. And this cycle just goes on and on and on. And the best example I can give you of this is what we did with the interstate system. Right? When we built the interstate system in Vermont, we put in you know, a foot and a half of sand, two and a half feet of rock, and then eight or 10 inches of pavement. And because we built it to standard, it was designed and engineered and constructed to standard, now what you see is they can just go through and resurface that and crack seal it and maintain the surface of it without having to rebuild it from the bottom up because they made that investment early on. So that's kind of the quick overview of a life cycle. Uh, and we also know that uh, treatments last a certain amount of time. So a crack sealing operation, it's only gonna buy you, you know, three to eight years. If we do a level and overlay treatment, maybe it's gonna last eight to 12 years. A large rehab, like a structural overlay or a full depth reclamation, we'll get 12 to 16, where something like new construction, like the interstate, it was built between 58 and 72. It's on average, so that's 1964. I can tell you that's pretty close to 60 years old. Uh, it lasts a long time when you build it from the bottom up. So, so those are some things we know. We know the life cycle of a road, we know when to apply these treatments, and we know how long the treatments last. And here's the point with this curve. So if you think of that initial graphic I showed you, this one shows the money. And not only shows the money, it shows what we call the area under the curve. And I don't want to get too technical on you, but if you look at this graphic, the area under the curve on the left side, below good and to the left of time, that reflects the condition of your road. And our objectives are to keep the, that area under the curve as large as possible for as long as possible. When our curve drops down to the bottom, we're very poor. We're losing that area under the curve. It means our roads are in poor condition. And the dollar sign is there to represent when we get to the very poor condition, it takes a lot of money to get it back up to good. So what we'd rather see for a graphic is more of a small sawtooth where it's gradual and we give a little bit of investment, get it back up to good and let that treatment perform and then bump it up again and bump it up again rather than these big arcs where we go from good to very poor, we start over, we infuse a whole bunch of money, we go back to good, we don't, let it, don't do anything and it falls back into disrepair. So. That's the takeaway from that. It takes a lot of money to go from very poor to good. These are a few of, uh, these are some ranges of cost per mile that we derived uh, that apply to your network of, of pavements. So we believe that uh, on average, your roads for preventive maintenance treatment is going to be somewhere between five and $25,000 a mile. Resurfacing for something like a level and overlay between 150 and 235,000 mile major rehab and major uh, reconstruction. Uh, well, and the yeah. range has to deal and with it. some of your class three highways are like 18 feet, maybe 20 feet wide. Some of them may be 30 feet wide. That width has an enormous impact on the cost of, uh, of a treatment. <coughs> the other thing that impacts the cost of a treatment is how much traffic is there, right? We have to maintain traffic. 
if we have a drainage system, if we have curbing, now we have to perform a milling operation. Maybe we're going to rebuild sidewalks, maybe we're going to add uh, signs and pavement markings and so forth. So all these other little um, uh, amenities, if you will, <coughs> drive up the cost. So that's why we look at a range of costs per mile that you can use for these types of treatments. Okay, so a little bit of pavement management there. Try not to get too, too technical or too wordy. Uh, but now we'll get into what some of the options are. So for, there's sort of three options, and I'll walk you through all of them. The first one is the most simplified approach, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's easy to do, it's very predictable, it's repetitive, and it can be very effective. And it's as simple as saying we have 34 miles of pavement in our inventory, in our network, and what we're going to do is say, we know that an average lifespan of our level and overlay treatment is 10 years. We divide that up by the 34 miles and we know that every year we have to pave 3.4 miles. We know the cost per mile is somewhere between 150 and 235,000. We could put a budget in there of five to $800,000 again, um, depending on what else goes along with these projects. And you would just keep paving every year, 3.4 miles and uh, so that's, that's one strategy. And I'll get to the pros and cons when we summarize all three options. The second option is akin to doing what uh, the states have done with the interstate system. Go in and say, we're going to uh, reconstruct this road. We're gonna put in the sand and gravel and pavement. We're gonna engineer it, we're gonna build it to current standards. And we know that, again, we have 34 miles. We estimate that you'd have to be reconstructing about one mile per year. And then we know the life cycle of the pavement, even though it's rebuilt, you're gonna to have to do some crack sealing every year. You're gonna to have to do some level overlays and eventually you'll have to do some major rehabilitations. And based on that approach, uh, we're estimating at about a, a budget of about 1.5 million a year for that work. And our third and final option is really somewhere in the middle, right? So it's a balance. And what we're saying here is that you know level and overlay can be effective but it's over over simplistic and you're not necessarily applying the right treatments at the right time to the right roads uh, and maybe we can't afford a uh, full reconstruction of every single uh, road in town so what we, we want to be a little bit more strategic and those roads that are in good condition let's keep them in good condition by doing things like crack sealing and, and uh, thin overlays uh, but yet we also know we have some roads in very poor condition and maybe the best thing for those roads is to step back and rebuild them bottom up. Uh, and so this is an option where you're going to be doing a combination of, uh, of treatments. And so we can estimate, uh, again, uh, some reconstruction, uh, level and overlay crack sealing and some major rehabilitations per year. And again, this budget is somewhere around a million per year. And now I'll try to summarize some of the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons of these options. So with our level and overlay, um, it's probably the least amount of money on an annual basis. Uh, on average, you will probably find that your roads end up in a fair condition category. You're never gonna get to where the whole network is in good condition because if the lifespan is 10 years, and the last three years of those roads are going to be from poor to very poor, then you know on any given year, you'll have about 10 miles or a third of your network that are in poor to very poor condition. The other 70% will be in fair to good condition, but that's a cycle that will continue. And as one road gets resurfaced, another one falls into the poor category uh, and you keep going. Option one, level and overly, again, your focus on the surface defects, so you're just treating the symptoms. You're just saying we're gonna resurface this road and it's gonna ride smooth for four or five years until it begins to degrade. And you're never addressing the root causes because you're just, uh, you're just resurfacing and not dealing with the, uh, the foundation issues. Option two, the full reconstruction approach. The big thing here is in the long term, it may be the most cost effective approach, but it's a cost loaded on the front end. So you just like Vermont spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to build that interstate a long time ago. 
was a big investment. Uh, they're, they're benefiting from it now in terms of their budget, but at the time, it was very cost intensive to, to build that. So it's reconstruction's cost loaded on the front end. The other challenge is, is that uh, the final miles that you get around to rebuilding, right? You've got 34 miles on the network. Those final, say, 10 or 15 miles that don't get rebuilt for another 20 years, well, you have to do something about those because they get in really poor condition. And so it's really difficult to, uh, you can't just do the reconstruction. You still have to do some other things. And then the um, option three is, uh, again, about a million dollars a year. On average, your roads will be in fair to good condition. It's a more balanced approach. You're applying timely treatments to the, uh, to the roads as they need them. Uh, and it gives you some ability to address the, the root causes of problems. So if your road is a, if it's failing structurally, if it's failing because of drainage, this gives you some more ability to go in and address those. Now, what I'll say is that even within those three options, it's not like you're ever locked into any one of those silos. The reality is you're probably going to be doing some combination of all three uh, that, that meets the, the, the most needs of the, uh, of the network. So um, that's really what we did. Uh, we went through, looked at what you have for paved roads, uh, did a network level analysis based on current conditions, came up with some cost information to try to give you folks a path forward. Uh, and that's way too much of me talking. And I'd love to take any questions. Or, I know that was a lot of information, but appreciate your patience and endurance. Okay. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, I guess what strikes me right away I, is the uh, amount, and we're only talking paved roads right now, number of roads that are in poor to very poor condition, and that's something that has occurred over a number of years to get to the state that we're in right now. <clears throat> and also the costs. You know, when we look at the, the budget that we have in this town, and we're talking some, some really, really big numbers here. Uh, I'll, I'll throw out, I got a couple of questions. I'll throw out one of them right now, and that is, uh, is, there, is there at the state level? I mean, every town in the state's got to be dealing with something similar. Morrisville is not necessarily unique. Um, is, there, is there grant money? Is there money available from from Department of Transportation at the state level? Is there money that, that, that's available for towns to, to begin to um, fix up their roads? So great question. And uh, there's, there's two that I'm aware of. Uh, one deals with, and I forgot to mention this as I was going through, but when we looked at a lot of the, uh, the network level analysis, we left out the class one town highways from that analysis because the state has an obligation. Uh, it's coded in statute, Title 19, uh, requires that the Agency of Transportation uh, pay for the resurfacing of Class 1 town highways. So we left that out of the, the analysis for that reason. I also believe that the districts have uh, resurfacing grants. So uh, if you're in contact with the, uh, the, the state district offices that I believe they have uh, paving grants for their class two town highways. I don't know about class three. I could look into that for you, but I believe they do issue uh, some paving grant money to towns. Okay. But you're right, all the, all the towns are in the same, very similar situation, unless they're extremely fortunate. Right. <clears throat> My other question is about non-paved roads. So I'm gonna hold off on that for a second and let the board ask some questions. I actually have a question in, um, in regards to that also is because we have a hospital, um, you know, there are certain roads that are priority getting to and from the uh, hospital. Does the state recognize that and offer any kind of funding as, um, you know, specialty that uh, emergency roads or do they recognize, make a distinction? on those roads? Yeah, I'm not aware of any um, sort of like corridor level approach where they would say this is, you know, an evacuation route or an emergency right. services route. And so there's dedicated funding for that. I'm not aware of that. But again, I left about seven years ago. So maybe yeah. maybe something has changed. But your district uh, contact or your regional planning commission uh, would be help very helpful in, in that regard. Yeah, that seems like that would 
be important for us because we are we do have a hospital here. Um, my other um, comment too, which I don't think I don't know if anybody has this. Uh, it's really interesting because there was um, a move quite a few years ago of um, plowing everything to 24 foot so that we could accommodate one truck. And it's really interesting um, for folks who don't have it that there's a roadway width and it talks about the tons of pavement and the cost. Um, and so basically a 20 foot road uh, to pay the cost of pavement for one mile is 150,000. When you go to 24 foot, which is what we are now paving everything to, uh, goes up to $200,000 uh, per mile. It's pretty significant. That extra four foot per mile cost us $50,000. Pavement is very expensive. There's... I thought I'd throw that out there. George? <laughs> I'm not sure it's, it's a question, but it, I think it probably is. Probably 10 years ago or so, the bypass came into play. That changed the, the route that a lot of trucks, heavy duty trucks were using coming into the village. That weight is going to be putting a greater strain on certain roads and maybe alleviating it on others. Obviously, your study was quite covered. Um, and I'm wondering whether those roads need, obviously, to get a higher priority when we look at whatever the options are, whether it's option one, two, or three, um, because they're, they're being utilized, used, maybe abused a bit more because of now, yeah. I think I think of Bridge Street from the bypass into the village is a, was a very lightly traveled road to the bypass came in and while the bypass has been a great thing it shifted that that traffic pattern drastically onto that mile maybe of, of bridge street um, and i just wonder how that kind of shift in load management rather than traffic management is can be factored into how we deal with substantial numbers no matter what option we look at yeah and you bring up a great point about the the change in use of any road and whether it was a byproduct of the bypass being built or whether it's a new industrial area that's being built or a residential area that is, is expanding. So any of those changes of use lead to more traffic, more loading requirements, more wear and tear. Uh, and so you're, you're actually absolutely right. Thanks. Richard? Uh, I was kind of thinking along the lines of what George was saying, just that those Bridge Street wasn't built to take mm -hmm. probably take that amount of traffic that's there now. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably the uh, God. What's the what, raveling? Raveling. Yeah. It's probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, so. In fact, many of the roads in Vermont were never engineered or built. They just evolved over time. And the state has a term that they use, and they call them cow paths, because basically it was a path at one point that was gravel, and then. Somehow, it, maybe they paved it, uh, and it just evolved over time. And so, most of the roads I suspect in town were never really engineered or constructed. They just evolved over time. And and now we're trying to go back and say, what options do we have to treat them? You know, at the surface level, when we know the best thing would be to get down and deal with the foundational elements. But Chris. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, David for providing this information, and I think the board is has available to them a street by street, you know, pretty detailed analysis of, of what the consensus of his uh, PowerPoint was tonight. You know, the harsh reality here is, is that, you know, for budget purposes, uh, short and long-term planning on what we need to do because we haven't done any uh, paving per se, other than some patchwork here and there over three years. And this gives us a detailed uh, evaluation of, you know, what deferred maintenance looks like uh, in dollars and cents. And um, I think that the uh, analysis is completely timely because we're heading into budget season. And um, we're going to need to develop a plan to move this forward because this is just paved roads. 
We've got sidewalks that we need to deal with, and we also have uh, graveled roads that we need to deal with. And if we don't start dealing with them, certainly <clears throat> the poor is, the poor evaluation is going to uh, become very poor. And you know, then we're really up against the rock. And right now, this analysis shows us that over fifty percent of our roads, paved roads, right now are poor, very poor. And I, you know, I think this is a good wake up call. I think this is important information and data. And I really appreciate David um, bringing this to the table for us. Well, thank you, Chris. I really appreciate that. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I took a few minutes to go through, you know, what is pavement management all about? Because, you know, why we can say that just north of 50% of your roads are in poor, or very poor condition. You also have about 30% that are in good condition. And so you have an opportunity there to preserve and maintain those and not let them get too poor and very right. poor. But it does re require some funding and some ability to execute some projects to make that happen. So, David, you, I, I said my other question was, was about those roads that aren't paved. You know, we have about 36 miles, as you said, of paved roads. And we, uh, Chris has alluded to sidewalks. And well, just to go back to paved roads, you know, you've, you've done that analysis for us, so we have a better understanding, certainly, of where our paved roads sit. We have uh, many miles of sidewalks in this town, and I think, uh, I think everyone up here on the board, and certainly probably in the audience as well, understands that our sidewalks are, are in need of, uh, need of repair as well. And LCPC is currently doing a, a sidewalk inventory for us. My question's about our unpaved roads, and we have about 76 miles of them in town. And there's been uh, discussion on how to better manage those roads. I just want to get your thoughts on this. Um, we have, like everywhere in Vermont, we have a very significant season, also known as the winter, and our town crews are maxed out all winter long, putting in plenty of hours and putting in plenty of overtime, and in the summertime they're looking for some vacation and they're looking for some time off. And uh, as a result, we have a lot of summer work that needs to be done. And one of the things that has been brought up by the public, it's been discussed here at the board level, is um, Maybe we should be doing some contract work. Maybe we should be, uh, like ditching is a good example, and mowing is a good example. Those are two things that we have plenty to do in this town. I just want to get your thoughts on, on that, about hiring contractors in the summertime to get that kind of work done. There, there's a lot to that question in terms of strategy. Uh, the one thing I will say before I jump into that response is that any of these assets, whether they're curbing, sidewalk, drainage systems, paved roads, unpaved roads, the principles that I described about pavement management, you can change that term and call it bridge management, sidewalk management, gravel road management, the same, all the same concepts apply, whether it's structural, drainage, preventive maintenance, rehabilitation, reconstruction, all those treatments, that whole concept applies to whatever asset you're looking at. In terms of, you know, this trade-off analysis of whether you're gonna perform work, self-perform work, or whether you're going to contract it out, it's that trade-off analysis. And it's, you know, the opportunity costs of that money. Well, why are you doing it? Are you trying to improve the network of sidewalks or gravel roads? Are you faced with that you don't have enough money to go around? Uh, and what would you be doing with that money if it wasn't being used for a certain certain purpose? So it, it's really a trade off analysis of what you're what money you have available, what you can get for it and getting the most out of that money. And it may be in some cases that contracting operations are more efficient. Maybe you can hire a contracting, uh, contracted mowing operation that can do it for less than you can. But you have, to, you have to understand whether it is economically the right decision. I'll say institutionally, there's a big risk when you contract out everything because you lose that institutional knowledge and it's very difficult to get that back. So let's say we talk about grading roads, for instance and you decide you want to contract out grading roads. 
And you, so you say, we don't need a grader anymore, and we don't need mechanics to fix the grader, and that all goes away. At some point, if you decide to change your mind, then it's very expensive to change that direction and have to go out and buy a grader and get the tools and equipment and get the knowledge and skills to perform that work again. So my only advice there is to say, if you go down that path, just be aware of you know, the pros and cons of, of any of your decision. Now, I'm working for a consultant now. I'm, I'm okay with people contracting out services, but I also worked for the government for almost 30 years where a big proponent of doing things uh, in-house because it can be cost-effective. So I'm, I don't know if that helps you at all, but uh, it's complicated. And it's, for me, it's really about the end of the day, the economics. How do you get the most you can for the money that you have? And that takes a little bit more work to figure out what is, what's the right call. Yeah, that, that is helpful because it, it does draw attention to things that we need to consider if we, if we do move in that direction. Yeah. So, Doctor? yeah, go ahead. So I just have a few points. First, David really want to thank you for your availability um literally from the first week i started working here i started looking for uh civil engineering um, providers that might provide a third party independent assessment of our roads um, my opinion was that the town crew did an assessment or we had somebody related to the town that might be questioned so nobody can argue with your your expertise um, I originally wanted it to be all of our roads, but uh, I didn't get a hold of his name and GPI's name until I believe August, and that was from Chris Jolly from Stubb. So I want to shout out to Chris, uh, but really appreciate you coming in with your hectic schedule. Civil engineering firms with these storms are really difficult to to get in to, to do anything, as we can see with just getting paid you know, short patching jobs down on Portland Street and, and Best Street um, with, with uh, construction crews as well. I, ha I have two questions for you or, or two topics I would like you to further discuss. One is, what's your professional opinion about, we have 52.8% of our roads that are very poor or poor. How many years of deferred maintenance did it take for 52.8% of our roads, and I know you can't you know, give us a specific, but in your experience, how many years of deferred maintenance does that usually take to have a road that's in very poor, poor condition? I don't know that I can give you a simple answer on that one. Uh, there are so many variables that contribute to how a road gets to be in poor or very poor condition. Um, you know, you've got the underlying soils, You've got the, you know, the, the groundwater levels, the, the use of the road, um, whether it's uh, exposed to the sun. I mean, there's just so many variables, the quality of the pavement that was used. There's just too many things to give you uh, to say that it's, it's 20 years when that happens. What we do know that, again, looking at like the interstate system, you know, a new road, brand new, constructed road, you're probably going to get 20 to 30 years out of it before you have to do something that is rehabilitative in nature. So, you know, preventive until maybe years 20 to 30, and then you got to do something more than that. So, but that's a, that's a road that was constructed. If it was never constructed. Yeah. Best Street, um, you and I had an additional meeting with some of the highway crew. Best Street, um, you know, water main replacement. Um, three years ago, we we had contracted out to repave it because you know the water main issue, and uh, so we did it this year because the water main was replaced this year rather than three years ago. But rather than just the paving crew come in, uh, the the town road crew had to move remove I don't know how many inches of of base because um, MSI was like if, if you paid this you're going to have an issue very soon because the base needs to be replaced. So the town road crew removed several inches and replaced it with, with new materials. Uh, the, th the third question I have for you is about, you know, George brought up road use on Bridge Street, et cetera. 
Can you talk about the, the amount of stress on any road, but especially class three roads in our, our residential areas for like a Casella or, you know, trash removal truck, what, what burden that, that puts on the, on the edges of our roadways? Yeah, so when we get into, when we think about designing a road or engineering a road, um, we need to know the number of trucks and the the actual configuration of those trucks to come up with this thing called an ESOL. It's an equivalent single axle load. And we use that ESOL value to come up with uh, the structural requirements of the road. It's really now the major vast majority of the vehicles are permitted to be over the road. There are special permits where you can get, you know, overload vehicles, but that's really a separate thing. Um, so if if for your smaller roads, you don't have the volume. So even though you may have some heavier loads that come and go, you know, on a, once a day, once a week, you know, five times a day, that's really you're never going to add up the easels to where you need a lot of pavement. Okay, the interstate might have eight, 10, 12 inches of pavement on it because it's easels and daily truck counts are very high compared to residential. Having said that, you get down to a point where there's a minimum pavement thickness that you have to have, otherwise it will fail because it just can't transfer that load to the gravel. There's just not enough for it to bridge the gravel so it fails. Um, so, you know, we, we know that the, like the single axle dump trucks, they're some of the heaviest ones out there. Uh, but really it's more about the volume of them than any single one. Uh, if you get past that minimum pavement thickness. Again, if you put out two inches of pavement on a road, it doesn't matter if you have three feet of gravel, that pavement's going to fail. It just can't distribute that load to the gravel before it overstresses the bottom of the pavement and cracks. I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, speaking of that, um, with technology that changes daily, um, how quickly are we seeing changes in quality of pavement, uh, pavement materials and equipment? Um, is, are we at a point where it's pretty, we're not seeing a lot of change or is it rapidly changing? It's not rapidly changing, it, it does evolve. Yeah. Uh, and I would, and I think I mentioned this in the report, you, you know, if you, when you do embark on some paving and road rebuilding, I really encourage you to be in contact with uh, the district and be in contact with VTRANS and adopt their specifications because they have, a, they have an excellent program in terms of their, um, their mix designs and their materials management stuff. And a lot of the, con you know, there's always criticism because they're tough specs, yeah. but the tough specs will get you a better product in the long run. So they're constantly tweaking things and making advances. It's not, it's not like IT, uh, it's not that dynamic. Yeah. It does evolve, but following their guidance and specifications is gonna you be your best bet. Okay, thank you. Other questions from the board? Chris? I'm all set, Don. Thanks. Okay. Questions from the audience? Come on up. Uh, David, I'm supposed to address it to Don, so. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Don, maybe Dave could uh, uh, verify that uh, the raveling that we saw on Bridge Street is not a deficiency in uh, the structure of the pavement, but rather a material deficiency. And that was Jerry thrown, by the way. Yes, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it's more of a material deficiency than it is structural, I guess is the shortest answer to the question. It's again, it's that loss of bond between the aggregate and the asphalt because the aggregate separates, it can ravel one stone at a time, and you'll probably see in the shoulder, you'll see that aggregate. Um, but yes, it's, it's, it's load induced because it's the traffic that's doing it and also moisture and freeze thaw cycles. 
but it's not like uh, rutting would be a more, or structural cracking would be more load related failure. Other questions? And any questions online? Go ahead, George. So I've got a, maybe an off topic. In the winter months, sanding versus salt. Effect on roads, different, same, plus minuses. I'm not an expert in sanding versus salting, but you know, intuitively, I, I don't see any difference in terms of how that would affect your paved surfaces. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good question, though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, come on up. Do we know how much cost to, to do the best street repavement in that job there? And since last year's $3 million budget that the onions had that did not include any for paving, who, who paid the best street? How did that get paid? Brent? Yeah. Uh, so it was approved three years ago, and uh, thinking that it would be done three years ago. Um, when they came to me with uh, the option of just filling it in as yeah. it had been, or considering that the, the, the amount of cutting they did into the pavement and the condition of Best Street already, mm -hmm. I was able to flex funds uh, working with Tina to be able to, to cover the cost of Best Street. Um, the, the cost, I do not know off the top of my head. I Don't hold me to this, but it was somewhere around $40,000 okay. to do it. Did, exactly. did you get that number from? It's right around 40000 just for the payment. Yeah, just for the payment, not the materials. Okay. With the, the average that you have up there, does that fit in with? So the question was, is, does, that, does that cost of 40000 fit in with the numbers that we derived? And the answer is that 40000 was very close to uh, the state average, what the state is getting for bid prices per ton. So you, you back it out and calculate it by how much is a ton of mix. And I think that best street was like $115 a ton. VTrans bid two year bid history was 107 a ton. So our analysis settled on $110 a ton, what we were using in our calculations. And as a great, we all know the roads, our problem is going to be how we pay it. We have $3 million last year in the maintenance budget with no pay. Mm -hmm. And we know about that. So I don't know how you're going to do it, but we're going to get it Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I think that was a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, David. Thank you very much for coming and doing your analysis for the town. And you've given us a lot of data. You've given us a lot to think about. And um, you know, I know the board and administration will will have a lot to lot to discuss going forward. So, my sorry. I just want to say to everybody, um, there's a full report, very detailed report that GPI provided, and that is on the website. So you all can, uh, you know, download it from the website or review it directly from the website. So. My pleasure. Pleasure to meet you all. Thank you. Okay. So Thank, you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Thank evening. You. Yeah. Appreciate it. And move on to number two. And Judy's ready. <laughs> You good? Okay, under new business, number two, further discussion of Jersey Heights Special Assessment District and Article Two. Um, we have discussed this a number of times. We're gonna discuss it again tonight. And uh, at the last meeting last week, there was, um, we took a poll of the board and the board agreed. Um, four out of five to continue this discussion tonight, especially uh, just on Article 2, and that's that's all we're really talking about tonight. Um, I want to uh, 
before we get going, I, I want to throw out the thanks to Brent and Judy for all the work that they've done. There's a tremendous amount of work that's been going on behind the scenes to get the information that uh, we've, you know, based our decisions on. Um, and so I just want to throw that out there. We, they, have uh, continued to do their homework. There's been a lot of work behind the scenes, as I've said, done over the last several months. This, I believe, is our sixth meeting to discuss Jersey Heights and uh, specifically Article 2. I believe this is our fourth meeting on Article 2, specifically. Uh, town administration did reach out to um, an attorney in town who, um, that's Julia Campagna, who is in the audience tonight, and asked her to gather some information regarding this issue. And I know the board has been privy to her uh, findings, and I would just ask her if she wouldn't mind to come forward and perhaps uh, give us the Cliff Notes version of that of, of those findings, not that the memo was that long, um, but it's worthy to note that uh, Julia works for Sergeant's Law Office and Sergeant's Law Office was involved in the um, situation where the town did take over the roads. And so there is a lot of information that was available there and we thank her for stepping up and providing us with some of that information so if you wouldn't mind just coming forward and and discussing a little bit of what you've been able to find out uh, at the microphone for sure So did the summary did the summary go out to folks as well in your packet or is we this received the, first? the memo? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's in the packets. So excuse me. Yeah. The summary is there in the very back. Um, so Richard Sargent in our office originally worked with the town uh, back in 2007 um, for the Title 19 process of acquiring a town road. When a um, private owner petitions a, the town or approaches the town to take over a roadway, it's under Title 19. And Richard is traveling abroad right now, so he wasn't available um, to come tonight and I went through our files and then reviewed some of the documentation in the town files as well. So basically the history that we were involved in was the Title 19 process of a worn notice of hearing to lay out a public highway and to take over roads that were built by a developer for a private subdivision. And um, they warned statutorily warned hearing was held. Um, it was warned as the um, laying out as surveyed to be established an acquisition of property from H.A. Menashe for public highway purposes. A deed was um, drafted by Jim Mahoney for H.A. Menashe, and it described under um, meets and bounds descriptions, which are what's used as measurements in surveys, and it laid out the access strip from Route 100, Jersey Way, so-called Foss Street, and so-called Best Street Extension. This defined the portion of the overall subdivision lands that H.A. Menashe was asking the town to take over. So if you think of it in terms of H.A. Menashe had this umbrella parcel 
that they went through the development and approval process for at the state and local level. They then approached the town to say, will you take over the right of way, the public right of way? Will the town take it on as a public road and take over the typical things, snow plowing, sanding, um, that type of thing? So the deed defined the actual physical parameters of what the town acquired. And the deed also incorporated, because like our office, Jim Mahoney's office would incorporate references to the development history of the parcel, the umbrella parcel, and all of the development permits that went with it. So that can include Act 250 permits, it included a subdivision, series of subdivision permits, and likewise, um, stormwater permits. So in the real estate world, when you have a parcel of land that's developed with all of these permits, the overall parcel is subject to the terms and conditions of those permits. And then as the pieces are broken off and individual people acquire those pieces, those pieces are also subject to the permits that run with the land. That's how chain of title works. The title standards in Vermont declare that anything that's happened in a 40 year period that affects the chain of title is baggage that comes with the lot when individual people purchase it. So Jim Mahoney's deed in book 144, page 533 of public record defines all of the permits that affect the town's public right of way and for folks here who own a piece of the umbrella parcel that is now the Jersey Heights subdivision that affects your lots as well. Um, there's a reserved 50 foot right of way to Howard Minash between lots nine and 10 that will serve uh, land that he retained that he um, may have possible future development of. Um, the parcel was um, again under title 19 for highway purposes. The town acknowledges that their acquisition of that portion of the overall subdivision umbrella parcel came with the terms and conditions being subject to, um, and one of those being stormwater, uh, stormwater discharge permitting. One of the important pieces in all of this, the town parcel that they acquired for the road right of way, which is the paved road and the sidewalks is subject to terms and conditions of the permits as well as yours. And uh, one of the important pieces is that any one of these development permits, Act 250 land use, subdivision, stormwater, if they lapse, if they're out of compliance, if there's a violation, that affects the marketability of title. That means someone going to buy or sell property in the development, or somebody going to refinance property in the development is going to have a cloud, an issue on title that you may run up against with a title insurance company, with a lender, with a realtor, with a buyer seller's attorney saying this needs to be cured. I've been involved in at least two transactions where the permit has lapsed. It was a compliance issue. We couldn't close on a deal until it got reinstated and, and the issue was cured. And it's easy enough to do, you just have to meet the, town, the state standards to become back in compliance. Um, the permit along the way, it started out with Charles Barnett, who H.A. Minash acquired the overall umbrella parcel from. Charles Barnett transferred to Howard Minash as the permittee. Um, Howard Minash in turn transferred to the town as permittee, and at the time that happened, um, the state through Jim Pease, who you all probably know, Jim Pease was formerly with the state of Vermont Stormwater Division, local guy, conservation commission member. He indicated to the town in a directive that they were responsible for the portion within the road right of way, and there would be a need for the rest of the balance of this umbrella parcel, which is now you know, 64 lots or whatever it is, to have some organization structure to it for their, their responsibility in the overall system. And it, um, it came about that he, he um, let me look at what he actually said. By, at that time, he mentioned that the town or the town and a co-permittee could take on the responsibility. So taking over as the permittee on a 
on a permit doesn't mean you're taking over ownership of the entire system. It means somebody is stepping up and taking the lead to oversee that the compliance stays up to date, that the permit is renewed, the fees for the permit renewal are paid. So just like you might have a general contractor that you hire to go out, you're going to do a project on your home, and the general contractor pulls the permit. That doesn't mean the general contractor now owns your home or your property. It's the same idea with taking the lead as a permittee on a stormwater permit. So Jim Pease's um, directive to the town says clearly, you know, you're responsible for the road right away, the town, the sidewalks, and, and the lot owners are responsible themselves. And he suggested erring on the side of caution for the town that you may not want to do this until an HOA has formed. Well, for whatever reason, the town said, no, it's okay, we'll, we'll go forward, we'll take responsibility. They helped get the stormwater system back in compliance at least twice that I know of. They renewed the permit so we could close on some transactions. And then along the way, this new legislation came in that said stormwater systems have to be brought up to a new standard. And the town looked at it and said, okay, we can avail ourselves of some public monies. We can have a private public partnership and really gel this thing now, even if an HOA hasn't been formed. The state said, yes, we can take a look at this and we can consider private public partnership exists between your joint effort and the easements that are in place. They could avail themselves of public grant money, which you would, if you were a standalone uh, subdivision of uh, uh, Pope Meadow or a DeMars or any other subdivision in town, and you were just the lot owners with an HOA or some informal organization, you couldn't avail yourself of these public monies. So the public-private partnership benefits, I think, the landowners in a huge way in availing yourself of public grant monies for a stormwater compliance issue that could bite you if you're trying to buy, sell, or refinance. The other piece of it is that um, the um, ability, if you have a public-private partnership, to choose to bond your portion over a 20-year period and minimize incrementally what you have to contribute is huge. If you were an HOA, a private HOA, and you went to Union Bank and said, we've got a $400,000 price tag on a project, they may not say, okay, well, we'll give you a 20-year note. So the, the, my review of the file was just to vet out what are the components here? How did this come to be? Um, the analysis was done by a civil engineer. He chose a method that determined impervious surface, how much of it is the town right away in the sidewalk, how much of it is your paved driveways and the rooftops. And in that ratio, how would the public-private partnership work together access the public monies, spread the private portion out over, you know, as much of a time frame as possible to make it affordable and reasonable, and to move the ball down the field so that it's no longer out of compliance, people can freely buy, sell, and refinance their property. Is there anything further, or do you want me to answer questions? Um, thank you, Julia. I mean, that's a, that's a great summary of of what's happened. I'm just gonna ask, you probably do wanna stay at the microphone, you might get a question or two, but board? I do not. I do not, I wanna thank you. I think that was a very clear, concise assessment of what has happened and where we are currently, thank you. Richard? No, that's great, thank you, Julia. Chris? Um, thank you, Julia. Um, so from what I understand of everything that I've read and, and also what you've um, shared with us tonight, the deed language that when they transferred the town road, when Minash transferred the, the road in the sidewalks, the deed language in that, in that warranty deed is, is the same as the warranty deed language in the transfer to the, new, the property owners. Is that correct? Or did um, I say that clearly enough? 
So I, I believe I understand the question. I can't say that I've looked at the lots for 62 parcels or whatever, however many there are out there. So the deed language may not mirror, everybody's deed language may not mirror each other or in fact the deed from Menashe to the town. That said, that's just a matter of how detailed the attorney drafting the deed wants to be or how it detailed the lender is making them um, describe the property that's the subject of a, a mortgage loan. What I can say is that anything that Charles Barnett or Howard Menashe did to build out the, the overall umbrella parcel, all of those permits run with the land and whether an attorney takes the time like Jim Mahoney did to list those permits and identify when they were issued and what the terms and conditions are so you can look at them in the book and pages of the town records. Everyone's lot by virtue of coming out of that initial host umbrella parcel that Howard broke up are subject to those permits. They run with the land, the title standards provide for if there's if it's mentioned in a 40 year period in the last 40 years if it's mentioned in some deed along the way as parcels change hands it affects title so when we buy property here it comes with encumbrances it comes with baggage that if you have an attorney do a title report and you read the fine print of the report you're going to see references to those permits and those conditions it may not be stated in the deed because in this case the deed would be you know six pages long if we listed everything that's happened with jersey heights in the last 40 years but that those encumbrances they're called encumbrances they affect title to the property their terms and conditions our properties are subject to, they run with the land. So in theory, everybody's individual deed, yes, comes with that baggage, whether it's stated in your deed or not. All right, well, that, that answers my question, Julia, and thank you very much for your research on this. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Brent, any, any yes. comments? Um, so I, I've been in the weeds on this for, for months since, you know, when you get into the weeds on something, sometimes you're you're presented with questions or assertions, and you're like, "Well, I've been dealing with this for so many months. Maybe I've misinterpreted something." Um, so I, I did reach out to Sergeant Law Firm because I know they were they were the attorney that helped with the the road takeover in 2007, and Dick was not available. So I want to thank Julia for for making herself available and you know uh, working with us. I. From what I understand is there's basically three issues that, that some residents uh, may be misunderstanding. The first one is with the 2007 warranty deed from Anash to the town, which spells out in, in very specific details the sections of the roadway and the right of way. And in that, it makes reference to the town being subject to terms and conditions, as Julia has mentioned. Julia looked at, at one deed, and as she said, you know, she's closed many, you know, she, she's home sales in, in Jersey Heights. So she, she's not gonna say that she's looked at all 64 deeds. Um, at one point, I was gonna try to do that last week, but uh, I could not. So I've looked at six deeds, and six deeds in one way or another reference for six different property owners that the, the same you know permits and stormwater otherwise that the town is responsible for so i i think that may be one misunderstanding um two people feel that since the town uh a town administrator in 2007 uh signed off with Manash, you know requesting the state transfer over to the town that that is evidence that you know the town is assuming full responsibility for a stormwater uh, solution that's primarily located on private land. And, you know, I, I didn't understand that, uh, but I not only reached out to Julia, but I double and triple confirmed with our legal counsel who has been helping me process through accepting these ARPA funds, doing uh, risk analysis on behalf of the town to make sure that in my communications with the state, that we weren't accepting something that would put the town at further risk because you know 
we had assumed responsibility for roads. So um, I think that you know Julia, you know Julia's law firm historically helped the town with the roads. Um, and the, the final thing I want to say is that I understand that that minutes don't necessarily capture everything that's discussed, and it would be impossible to do that. But the only motion that was ever made by the select board and approved was for acceptance of the roads. And I'm sure all of you can understand that just acceptance of the roads and a deed, there's, there's other things tied to it. And there are communications from, from Agency of Natural Resources talking about, you know, making sure that, recommending that there should be an HOA tied to that, that permit. But, and, and who knows why that wasn't done? Um, but I, I have two attorneys telling me that being the permit holder does not mean that you accept 100% responsibility of a subdivision wastewater treatment facility. Stormwater. Storm Storm Thank you. No, Stormwater. <laughs> um, so um, I, I don't want people to think that like this is ego. Um, I can understand how this can easily turn into that because it's such a difficult issue to deal with. Uh, it's difficult for the residents, it's difficult for, for everybody here. And it's certainly something I didn't want to uh, start dealing with um, my first week on the job. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I did go back and I, I did ask for reevaluation and, and confirmation that, you know, recommending to the democratic vote of the town was something that was logical. And um, I won't speak for Julia, because you're here, you, you, can, you can say what you want to say about it, but um, our legal counsel involved from the get-go with this um, said that it's very logical and, and legally sound, that you, know, you accept responsibility for the permit, you accept responsibility for filing it, for, for even paying for it, but you don't accept, accept responsibility for 100% of the costs you know, if, if something needs to be done for it. Thank you, Brent. And thank you, Julia. Um, last week, we, we had a board meeting and we agreed to move this conversation forward one more time. Uh, for me, anyways, I can't speak for all the members of the board, but you've certainly further clarified the issue, um, especially regarding the deed and I appreciate that. This has been a, a long and frustrating process for everybody, and it's been frustrating for us on the board. It's been certainly frustrating for the members of uh, the, the parcel owners in Jersey Heights. I, I, I get that. Um, I've put myself as best I can in your shoes many, many times over the last couple of months. I can't step into them completely, but I've, uh, but I've tried. And I, I, for one, feel like we're ending up in the same place that we, that we were when the board made their decision to make this a, a, a democratic decision to let the voters of Morristown decide on this special tax assessment district. And I do think that is um, the right place for it to be. Um, we do have individuals that have already voted in town. Um, we have individuals that will that are about to vote, and will do so over the course of the next couple of weeks. And for me, anyways, um, thanks to all the work that Brent and Judy have done, Julia stepping up and doing the work that she's done, and I know we've we've had some other legal counsel as well. Um, it, it it it's difficult for me to to alter what we've already started. But I will let the rest of the board comment if they would like. Nope, I concur. <laughs> you talk? George? Yeah, I concur as well. I concur. <clears throat> I, I really appreciate the, the clarification that you provided to us. Thank I you. Did, did, there's a lot of things up here. Yeah. Thank you. Chris? Thanks, Don. Um, I think that um, over the last 
two or three months that we've been talking about this, um, we've taken a very clear, steady, concise um, pathway to uh, come to this conclusion. And um, I think that to uh, reconsider anything else is a disservice to all of the taxpayers here in Morristown. Um, it's a democratic process. Um, we need to let that democratic process play out. We've committed to it. And um, I think that we just need to move on at this point. Thank you. Um, as always, I'd open it up to the audience for comments. I would ask you to address my co your comments to myself. Julie, if you want to take a seat. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay. Uh, hearing none, I will... Yeah, actually, go ahead. Okay. Come on up. Just identify yourself again, please. Um, Holly Baker, 242 Jersey Way. So, um, as I understand it, and I still don't really understand all of it, um, the, there have been houses sold in the last few years, and it seems like our permits are not in compliance. Uh, I was one of the people, I was trying to sell my house and I pulled my listing, but I'm still going to try to sell again, maybe. Um, so how are the sales happening if our permits and we're not in compliance? Is it that people aren't reading through the full deeds? I'm sorry, it's not to you. It's Yeah, that's okay. And I mean, certainly for the board, that's for me, that's a question I cannot answer how those sales are going forward. I, I'm not a, uh, a title lawyer. I have two questions, so my other one. What's your, would you want? Yeah, this yeah. one first. Yes, I'd like it on there, please. So to answer her question, it's a good question. Um, the stormwater permits run in a series of years. So um, some of them were three years, some of them were five years. Um, there's some attorneys who aren't as thorough as others at looking at title and examining whether something is in compliance or not. So um, oftentimes, if there's a cash transaction, a buyer may say, I don't need you to do a 40 year search. They're my neighbor or I know them and we're just going to buy it. Just just do the work to change to transfer title. So there's a number of reasons why it might not be caught. But I can tell you that our office and every other office I know will look at permits to see if there's violations, to see if they've expired, they've lapsed, and there isn't a lender out there who will close a deal if they're informed by an attorney that the permit is, is lapsed. I've had to delay closings until the town could um, renew. Thank you, can, Julia. Can I just follow up? Yeah, go ahead, Brent. So, um, <clears throat> Town did file a permit, I believe it was in 9050, um, several years ago, and I'm sorry, I don't have that. I might have it in here, but it take quite a while. And it's been pending by the state for a number of years, specific to no HOA uh, being formed. So I don't know if, you know, some attorneys are, are sort of annotating that for the title companies and, and the, the, the lenders that it's, it's not, it's not, Julie can correct me, it's not necessarily lapsed, but it's just sort of pending out there. It's not approved either. And maybe that's another factor. Julie, if you, you could just respond to that. I can. Um, again, good question. So that's absolutely correct. And um, some lenders have looser underwriting standards. Some title insurance companies will say, I have one right now, and it's I have a trend. I have two transactions going in Jersey Heights, and I've had to disclose to the lender and to the title insurer this is what's happening with the town of Morristown. The permit is timed out. It's not in compliance technically. There's this pending action. We're waiting for an outcome. We believe November 5th will be it. And are you willing to insure over it, or are you going to stop the presses and we can't close? One of them said we'll write over it and you just need to follow up when the dust settles and tell us how it all ended up. The other one said, no, we're not going to close until that's resolved. So that's when I say, and that could be 
whether it's a, like something big like this, a stormwater permit, it could be any permit violation can stop the clock on a purchase sale or um, refi, and that can be a local zoning violation. It, it's, it's, it, it's a marketability issue on title. So it, the better quality of the title, the cleaner it is with your permits and compliance, the faster and easier it is to buy, sell, or refi. Stay there for a second, please. So, after November 5th, we will have answers. Whether there is a, a, a special tax assessment district or not, whether we're borrowing money or not. But right. we're going forward. Yes. Assuming there's no appeal of any of the votes, would that then change how you would present a parcel that's in transaction? From, we've got, now we have authority for something. The something hasn't been decided yet. Yes. But and something is there. Right. But does that change how you approach it? Um, the approach isn't different, but it could change the outcome. My job is to analyze the title, report it to the lenders, underwriters, and report it to the title insurance council, who pick it apart with a fine tooth comb. And they determine how much of a risk is it at that point. And if the if at that point it's, okay, we have a vote, we're gonna bond, it's gonna move forward, ultimately it'll end up being cured, being resolved, they're likely to insure over and to close. But I may have to chase after the closing and provide updates to the underwriters and to the title insurer that says, yes, this happened and this happened and that happened. So there may be some follow-up on my part. And if somebody has a title insurance claim in the meantime, that's the legwork they'd have to do for the insurer to pay out is to say, yeah, you took a risk on us and you closed with this in limbo and now we've had you know, some glitch and we need to file a title claim and all the ducks are gonna have to fall in a row before the insurer will pay out. Thank you. Yeah. So based on that, my second question is pending the vote and as um, George said, it's moving forward one way or another, how soon are we in compliance again so that we can move forward with a home sale without complication? Is there an easy answer to that? Um, the, the grant deadline for submitting a, a new permit is March of next year. Um, I'm working to more on the engineering work to get that done much sooner. Um, so it's more than likely that that pending permit, there'll be a new solution submitted, which will be good for everybody because um, Tyler's certain, pretty certain that it'll cost less uh, for everybody involved. Um, and again, he's, as I've said before, he's dealt with this in another municipality. The very same stormwater solution was submitted, you know, back around the same time that we submitted ours. Um, it was was pending, we move forward with a cheaper alternative. So I would say that um, we're hoping to submit much earlier than March and it's up to the state about how long they take to review uh, that, that submission, but they are motivated to review it as quickly as possible too, because they have these federal funds that they we need to meet milestones before we can draw on those federal funds. So they're motivated to have those federal funds be drawn upon. Okay, thanks for that. And my last statement is just a comment of, um, you know, I'm a taxpayer. I, we all work hard for money. I work ex exceptionally hard and taxes are part of our life. But I think my biggest issue is the fact of, and I'm sorry that you got thrown to the wolves here, of how this was handled. Um, that was my issue all along wasn't that I wasn't going to pay pay my taxes. I pay with my what I owe. But this this whole thing has been extremely stressful and agonizing. And um, I just hope that we will get regular communications moving forward on how this progresses because it directly impacts us um, and future home sales because um, we're wanting to list again in February. So hopefully we'll have something by then. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to finish with the audience first. Anybody in the audience? Yeah. Go ahead. Dale okay. Touchet. So Those of you online, I'm going to let the audience ask their questions first, and then I'll get to you. 
So the approval of the permits, that's up to the town every year to make sure that there's a three year, five year, um, you know, whatever you have to do for, on these applications to the state. It's, it's taken care of by the town. It has been in the past. Okay, yeah. and that's how it's going to continue. The next question is, um, so are you taking care of the maintenance of this new system that's being put in? Is that up to the town to take care of the system also? We will be, yes. Seeing, yeah, go ahead. Brent? Yeah. So in response to the concerns uh, with the residents around a special assessment uh, district, you know, extending out to perpetuity, the motion that the select board uh, passed unanimously limits the amount of time uh, to pay back the, the costs for this stormwater. And they, the, the, the select board unanimously, unanimously voted to assume responsibility for everything going forward so that this district does not go on into perpetuity. Okay, okay. thank you. Other comments in the audience? Go ahead, Maria, I believe. <clears throat> Hi, Maria Ward. I think I need to issue all of you a very public apology. I uh, thought I did my homework, and I thought I was right. I thought you were wrong. Um, and for that, uh, I apologize. Um, I still don't agree, obviously. I don't think there should be a special tax district. I think this is um, something that should be borne by the town. Um, it's unfortunate that we didn't hear Julia in the beginning. Maybe we wouldn't have had six meetings. Um, I wished I was a lawyer, so I didn't have to stand up here and tell you all that I'm sorry. And I am. Um, no need to apologize, Maria. It's all part of the process, and yeah. we've very much appreciated your comments and your thoughts I thought over the last the several right couple months. You for did myself, from my neighbors. I just want to say we we discovered a lot of information that probably needed to come out. Um, so it's been painful for all of us, um, but you know we now know what has happened, and we can move forward. So yes, it's good. Um, I do want to say, though, I still think that uh, the article should fail. I think the wording is untrue and incorrect. Anybody that reads Act 64 will see that the reading of the article contains an untrue statement. Uh, this does not benefit the 64 residents of Jersey Heights. Uh, this, as the Act states, the, the benefit is the waterways of the state of Vermont. Um, so that I will hold steady with, but thank you. Thank you, Maria, for your words. Uh, Brent? I just want to thank Maria for her civility, and I think that the questions that she brought up just made uh, myself, and unfortunately Judy, <laughs> <laughs> work harder for, for more direct answers. So I really appreciate Maria's um, presence at these meetings regularly and her civility, because people can choose not to be civil when they disagree, Yes, and that does not help. Uh, so thank you. I just want to thank Maria, too. For Tom Cloutier? Tom Cloutier, for all the work that she put into it, too, and to try to Give the board an idea of what's going on with your decisions, the impact that you're having on families, and the stress and worrying about whether they're going to sell the house or not. The town was dealing and paying for that the whole time. And you can come up with the legal things, which is, it is correct. But this is the last minute we're hearing from her. I mean, I. I we should have known about this before it even got to be decided. And you've heard a lot of people, and, and uh, this vote is not going to help either. And I, I said at the beginning, for just a zero point zero zero one percent of the budget was what we're talking about here. And we've gone through all this pain 
in agony for $81,000. And here we're talking about, what, $120,000 to pave a friggin' road. I, Riga, you know, I, 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 I just, I'm just lost for words on it. I hope it changes. The town paid for it. They should pay for this whole thing, get it over with. And uh, vote, I'm still telling, vote no on this. Have the town pay for the whole thing. And, and we would have saved that. If we, we would have saved a lot of money. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. You're in a loss of words, really. Go ahead. <laughs> Dan, then. Jerry. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> hi, I'm Dan McLaughlin from Morris Hill. Um, I'm curious, following the, um, the the chain of responsibility that she explained, out of curiosity, do the subdivision regulations that the subdivision was approved under require the homeowners association? I don't believe they do. In other words, at a certain point, it's, as they sell lots, usually um, a certain percentage of the lots are sold. The wording of the subdivision would require that a homeowner be established by then, and then the responsibility transfers from the subdivider to the homeowners association. And it, I especially thought about it, especially the chain of responsibility. So if it wasn't part of the subdivision regulations at the time, the subdivision went through, that's fine. Um, but I'm curious about that because of the question that Dale asked. Um, she wanted to know, do we have to worry about this anymore as far as signing up or renewing permits on the individual homes as we go forward? Or will they be taken care of by the town from now on, given that there isn't the homeowners association. In other words, the next time the permits have to be redone, are, are, is the town going to redo all the permits or just the ones on their road? Do the individual homeowners have to pay attention to whether or not these permits that are in their deeds get redone? I think was her question, and I, I didn't get a clear answer on that. So that's, that's, is, I, it, is it the plan of the town to continue to take care of these permits going into the future? The stormwater permit? Yeah. All, all the landowners is, are subject to compliance with various permits. They, they have to do their own permit then. They, we are taking over response, the town is taking over responsibility of the stormwater permit. Altogether. Over the over the whole for, for the whole subdivision. for the whole subdivision. Yes. Yeah, again, I I wasn't real clear on that, and I think that was the question that Dale was asking. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, there's one permit for the entire subdivision. subdivision, and from now on, that will be updated by the town. Correct. Oh, that's great. Thank can, you. Can Thank I you, ask just um, I want just the H O um, H O A. Um, that's I would say that's a question for Todd Thomas in zoning. I can tell you, having served on the D R B that any division that came through um, while I was on it since 2016, we required an HOA. And I know that where I moved in, I looked at Jersey Heights, my subdivision was built in 95, and, and it has two HOAs for, for the first development and the second one. So I'm not sure if it was a zoning requirement at that time, but Todd would be the one who would be able to tell us if it's now required. I, right, yeah. right. And, and the only reason that I asked that question was because as <coughs> subdivision regulations get transpire, they keep getting, they find loopholes, they find stuff. Oh, dang, we better do that from now on, you know, that type of thing. So I, that's why I asked if it happened before then. And also, I wasn't real clear on what Brent explained, that yeah. the town would do the permit to cover the whole subdivision. Okay, thank and you. that's great. Thank you, Dan. So just so there's no undue worry about the town or the state still going after the residents of Jersey Heights uh, to create an HOA, um, the state in a meeting in June where they presented stated that they can't force Jersey Heights to create an HOA now and uh, the town doesn't have the authority to do it. So um, there's 
going forward, you know, there's no, they, they've wanted an HOA for a number of years, and that's currently why the 9050 is, is pending, but they aren't going to try to force the issue. Part of the reason is, is that the town in August, the select board, unanimously voted to accept full responsibility going forward. Um, and based upon the, the plan that was moving forward, you know, special assess, assessment district would be voted on, et cetera. So what is the cost of that permit yearly? I don't have that in front of me. I have to get back to you. Um, I'm just curious because we we've, we've been paying it for ever. So I, I just think what are what is what have we agreed to pay on I a yearly basis now? Just curious. Uh, Chris on Zoom. I'm just going to let him speak as a board member. Thanks, Don. Um, so the in the member. deep dive of archival information in the basement of the um, town office, it's sort of supporting documentation for meetings. Um, we discovered um, covenants on the properties when they were sold to individual property owners from the beginning of when the subdivision started to grow. And nowhere in the covenants did it require an HOA. So um, unless the residents there decided to do that on their own for whatever, it was never a requirement uh, from H.A. Minaj to the property owners to do that. Other comments from the audience here? I did last. Chris speak just as a board member. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. Jerry Throne. Uh, do not live in Jersey Heights, but I do pay taxes. So uh, I'm concerned that uh, there may be a precedent set if what the Jersey Heights residents are asking for, which is that the town pay for the whole thing. I'm concerned that a precedent might be set, whereas any of the other properties that currently are not in compliance with that act, and I believe there are 13 of them in addition to Jersey Heights, that the town may be getting itself into something that will cost the town and us taxpayers, not just the taxpayers of Jersey Heights, a lot of money in the future. That's my concern. We're already paying, or will be paying, all of the taxpayers will be paying for maintenance and upkeep uh, of the system. Don't know what that's going to be. I don't expect anybody here knows what that's going to be. Because if we did, we would know what the next lucky number is going to be that's pulled out of a hat. So those are, are concerns that I have as a taxpayer. I have a question. I, I went through Jersey Heights today for the first time, just to get an idea and a, and a, and a view as, as to what it is that uh, is out there. And I just happened to notice that one of the streets is a private street. And I think it's on the list of the uh, 64 residents that are involved with this. And so if it is indeed a private street, um, is it something that the town should be taking over the maintenance uh, of that street, the, the plowing? And, and should, you know, should that be broken out is my question. Do you know the name of that street? Uh, it's um, Jersey Way, I believe it is. I mean, that might be. Jersey Court. That's it, Jersey Court. Oh, yep. That is private, owned by the Congress. Okay, and aren't some of those on the list of people that are uh, part of the 64? I don't know. Are they Brent? So uh, the Jersey Court condos, uh, that was apportioned to the condos and then broken out per parcel within the condos. So that portion goes into the specific parcel parcels tied to those condos. The 34% includes all the roads, the sidewalks, but um, that that section that you're referring to was allocated pro rata of impervious surface to the condos. 
So 34% does not include Jersey Court? No. Okay. Does the town maintain that street in the wintertime? No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. Other comments from the audience before I go online? Come on up. Uh, Evelyn Throne. I just had one question. Um, the It was brought up by one of the residents that uh, the Act Article 2 that was written uh, was not accurate because it said that Jersey residents, uh, it stated that Jersey residents, Heights residents benefited uh, from this, would benefit from this. My question is having, you know, you, you looked at it through legal, so I wanted you to answer what your, what your response to that would be. And also um, the fact that it would be, their deeds would be free and clear at some point because of this process. Is that the, how the wording is accurate? Is that part of why the wording could be accurate? Or what is, what is the response to that, um, that concern about the wording of Article 2? So that wording very much came from legal counsel, of which we obtained a lot early in this process. And so that is, that is wording that our legal counsel gave to us. So that word is in there for, for that reason. Okay. Yeah. So all of this is tied to the subdivision permit that all of the 64 residents um, live in for Jersey Heights. So the argument could be made that by the town accepting responsibility to capture the, the, the cost, 73% 70, or more of the cost for the stormwater solution to get it back into compliance with the state, that could be argued as, as betterment. Um, that, that lawyers can point to the fact that, that there has been a motion passed accepting responsibility um, and that the state will be removing that HOA requirement and that permit will eventually come into uh, active status compliance. That could be considered uh, a betterment for the community. Three, um, if, if the town and the community just kept kicking this down the road, eventually the state is going to enforce. And so uh, when they do enforce, they're going to be making not only the, the people subject to the terms and conditions of this subdevelopment responsible for bringing the, the stormwater solution up to this required standard, but they're gonna issue penalties too. So preventing penalties from being issued against the residents could also be argued as betterment. Is all of this fair to the residents of Jersey Heights that we're all dealing with this? No, it's not fair. Um, but there are definitive arguments to show that it is for the betterment considering the circumstances. Um, because it, it, it is impacting some current sales, as we, we just heard tonight and as she brought up previously. And uh, kicking the can down the road, waiting for the state to enforce and then issue additional penalties uh, and not taking advantage of, of the cost, you know, 70 Three percent plus of the cost um, would, you know, would be something that would not be good for the residents. Thank you. I can't see. The, I I see a familiar face up on the screen, but I can't see a name. Is it Deb Dever? Okay, that's who I thought it was. Go, I'm going to let you go. You've been waiting a while. Okay, and it's um, it's really just a comment. Um, I bought my condo in Jersey Heights one year ago, and in my deed, there was nothing disclosed about a stormwater permit being out of being pending or not in compliant or whatever. And my deed also. And we have an HOA for the Condominium Owners Association. We do have an HOA. And when I 
found out about this um, when this summer, I called up my attorney and I said, what happened? Why wasn't this disclosed in my title search? And they were just as surprised, but they said they had come into contact with someone else who was buying a place and he was doing a title search in Hyde Park with the same issue that came up. So he apparently, wherever they get their information to do the title search, there is a gray area that's not spelled out. So if there should have been a red flag, I should have been informed about this and I wasn't. And I understand this has to move forward and I'm um, I'm glad that the attorney came tonight to talk to us and, and, and even say that not everybody does the title search to a big, um, in so much detail. I mean, I thought it was pretty, a lot of detail. I bought and sold several houses in Morrisville. So um, I was really looking forward to being part of an HOA and not having to worry about extra unexpected expenses. Um, but I understand what, what the position that the town is in and the select board and 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 I'm all about helping the environment. I, you know, I work at UVM and all, we're all about that. So, um, but I just wanted that to be brought up. I don't know how um, it can be conveyed to the attorneys that are doing the title searches or um, whatever, but it's really a concern because we trust our attorneys. We trust our attorneys to represent us and to do the right thing and to give us a red flag when we're buying and selling properties. That's all I, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Deb. Okay, so we've had multiple nights of conversation here. I'm gonna ask if there's new information to please come up. Martin Green, Best Street, and Best Street is not part of Jersey Heights, although it's surrounded by Jersey Heights and the folks from Jersey Heights are my neighbors. And I just wanna express a concern and, and help me here if I, if I don't understand. I don't claim to fully understand everything that's going, but correct me and uh, help me if my understanding's limited. But I, I see maybe something that's a little concerning to me um, about what's happening here with Jersey Heights. Uh, my attitude is these are my neighbors. We're, we are a town, we are a community. We share expenses, we share responsibilities. So I am 100% willing as part of my taxes to help take care of that. Um, and I, you know, I, I remember two years ago where there was a town vote on the sidewalks over in Jersey Heights that packed the auditorium of People's Academy. And we wanted, you know, for that area, about 20 feet of sidewalk for safety. That was the main reason, was for safety's sake. That got voted down. Um, and I don't know if the attitude from some taxpayers was, well, that's Jersey Heights, that's their thing. Um, I don't begrudge people needing work, whether it's Cody Hill, those are my taxes, it's part of the community, these are my neighbors, whether they're in Jersey Heights or somewhere else. That, that's, that's the way I feel is that we all share these responsibilities. So I'm perfectly willing uh, to help shoulder that with these folks who are my neighbors here. And so my concern is, you know, I, I would just hate to see um, these, these projects become like partisan. Well, that, that's over there in Pope Meadow or it's over here on, on, uh, on Bridge Street. So therefore, you know, that's not, that doesn't concern me. I think what happens in the town concerns all of us. I live on Best Street and I thank God that that road just got paved. It was probably 30 years because we've, we've, we moved in there 30 years ago and I think that's when it got paved last. So we are, we're grateful for that. But why would anyone in the town begrudge 
best street being paved. It's, it's just part of the town. So I just wanted to express that, um, my concern that these things kind of get parceled out. I just wanted to express that, you know, we're, we're all part of the same community and as such that we can help each other and help our neighbors. Um, we all pay taxes to, to shoulder those things. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> so, as I've said, we've had volumes and volumes of discussion on this. So, unless there's something really brand new and pressing, I'm going to bring this to conclusion. And thank you. It has already been said, but thank you for the discord. Um, it is a very emotional and very frustrating issue, as we've seen once again tonight. So. I thank you all for that. Old business, I'm gonna move on with the agenda. Old business, we have none. <clears throat> Approve the warrants. We do have warrants for tonight. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the warrants. So I have a motion to approve the warrants. Do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I do have one uh, question. This is just kind of a statement in uh, looking through the bills and as an event producer, um, oftentimes when uh, I have been contracted to do events um, or any kind of activities, it's required that um, if I'm in a town that we purchase any food or anything from the town businesses to support it, um, so, because I noticed a bill in here for uh, lunches that aren't in town. So I'm just saying going forward, it'd be nice um, if we're contracting out to say that uh, as much, you know, that can be purchased in town is purchased in town. And that, that's pretty industry standard. So just saying. No, <laughs> it's not a big deal. Any other discussion regarding the warrants? Okay, I'll do a roll call. Laura? Aye. George? Aye. Richard? Aye. Chris? Aye. Don is an aye. That is unanimous. Community comments. If you have a comment, please come up to the microphone. I would like to make comment on what in the world is going on down the Oxbow. We were down there, Don, you and I, and Laura, after the second flooding. And uh, we saw what happened after the second flooding. And I think we all, in fact, you made the motion that, or us said to me that there was a waste to put any more money down there at the flooded zone at Oxbow. I go down there today and they're clearing out the rocks and I don't know what that's about. But all that sand that they're putting on there, the next flood, that's going to be gone. So I hope the town is not putting a lot of money into that. And then I see we're going to put a bunch of trees. I'm hoping that they're going to put those trees not in the flood zone, but up by above it. Is that, am I? It's, are the trees going in down there in that flood zone? So, for, so I, I'm not, my comments are going to be very short and sweet here. The rocks are being removed, I think, as a safety issue. Okay. Uh, the trees that are being put in there are, or the proposal, I don't know exactly where that stands right now. That's not, uh, it's not, it's not my issue right now. Um, but. I, we'll, we'll find, you know, I, I think that there's some communication between the town and uh, Peter Danworth over at Lamoille Conservation District it's, regarding uh, what may happen there. So I'll just leave it at that for now. So it's and, and not. Do we have any idea how much it costs to get trees, rid of those rocks? Which I mean, I don't I, understand what the danger is there. We can get you that number. Because the, the first time we went down there and cleaned it out, FEMA paid for it. 32,000 of it. The town still paid $8,000 after the first one to clean it up. 
So it's been costing us money down there. And, and I hate to see the bulldozer down there because they're not doing that for nothing. That's a good expense. And then this fellow's going to go down there and plant 300 trees. They're going to end up the next flood down at the dam. How do we stop that trees from going in there? Can we? So, um, I'll, I'll just say you and I very much agree that there should not be a lot of taxpayer money going into the restoration of the lower okay. oxbow. Yes. The planting of trees is not taxpayer money coming from the town. So uh, I'll well, just well, say that. It is state taxpayer money. It is. It it's, is. It's taxpayer but, money. I mean, it's our money. I don't, I, care. I don't I want to get into it. an argument with you, it's, Tom, but I, I agree with you. We, I agree with you on the It's taxpayer's money. I agree with you. I mean, all of it. I also so, think restoration of the environment's not a bad idea. No, I don't either, but as long right. as it's going to stay. But it's not going to stay down there. Come on. We, all right. Other community right. comments? Go ahead. Evelyn Throne, yeah, two comments. I won't, we won't go into a whole debate about Oxbow Park, but the only reason the trees are going in is to help slow the water down that goes, and if you put it above the floodplain, you might as well just be putting it decoratively through the town. Um, but that's the whole thing. There should hope be a presentation about that, and I'm sure there will be when it's time to do it. Um, of course, it is taxpayer money, but it's through the state, and. Uh, you know, state has to take care of the environment. But um, the uh, the other question was, I, I'm, I'm just a concern. I'm hoping that we are going forward with talking about uh, like a traffic plan through the town. And certainly, one of my pet peeves is um, how Congress Street is basically a straightaway raceway. Mm. Um, I'm sure it was really a nice idea to put that uh, saw, you know flashing thing that said how fast you're going. Someone told me that they are people have used it as a, a, a contest to see how fast they can go, because it's you know it, they hit 80 at one point. One of them did. So, but if there was um, tables put in, you know, on that street speed speed tables put in, you know, maybe two places on that street, and even over on Maple, it couldn't they couldn't do that, you know. Uh, so it's certainly something to look at, but it would be part of maybe the whole comprehensive plan. I hope you're really moving forward with this because we need bikes in this town. We need it to be more safe for everybody. Thank you, Evelyn. Other community comments? I'm going to move on to the schedule. Uh, it's the upcoming schedule. So next Monday we will have another informational meet. Well, we will have our statutorily required information meeting regarding the uh, vote on November fifth. On um, by the way, remember the first select regular select board meeting was canceled in November because it was uh, scheduled for the night before election day. So we'll have our regular our next select uh, regular select board meeting on November eighteenth. On November twentieth. This is new, uh, something a little bit different. We will have a eight hour meeting during the day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. for the select board to discuss the budget. Unlike what we've done in years past where we've done every two weeks, one department comes in and presents, this year we're going to do the budget all in one day. Or at least that's the plan at this point. Any comments about schedule? Okay. Any other business? I don't believe there is. Just, um, just one not. question. Oh, oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. The informational meeting is that here in the town offices? That will be here in the town. Yeah, that okay. would be here. Right. Just confirming. Thank you. Sorry, did I miss I'll you? Be out of town. On the 28th. Okay. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Then. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I have a motion. Do I have a second? You have a second. So I have a motion by Richard and a second by George. Do I have any discussion? Laura. Aye. George. Aye. Richard. Aye. Chris. Aye. And Don votes aye as well. That would be unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.